Very good. Okay, welcome everyone to my talk. Um, I'm Jonas, working for Eclipse Source. Uh, we are a company um, supporting our clients in creating tools. And today I want to give a talk about building a web IDE based on Eclipse for smart home. Uh, if you look at that title, you might have noticed uh, it contains a lot of buzzwords like Web IDE, Eclipse Smart Home, and that's probably why you're here. Um, I did it actually that way because I wanted this talk to be accepted. I really wanted to give it. <laughs> the real title of this talk should actually be 35 minutes on building a web IDE based on Eclipse which is capable of creating an app which, is, which can be deployed on a smart home system, which is finally capable of turning a light switch on and off again. So why I mention that is, um, so I will, during the talk, develop an app for smart home. Um, but this talk is not about smart home, it's about the tool to build that app. And that's why the app is very simple. Literally at the end, uh, I hope it works, I can press this button and the light will turn on and off again. Um, and I admit there are simpler ways to get there, in case you just want to achieve that. Okay, fun aside, um, one sentence about this talk. Um, uh, you you uh, you can see at this conference that web IDEs and especially Eclipse Theory is a very interesting topic at the moment, um, and there are a lot of technical talks about this uh, those frameworks. Um, a typical problem is um, you never really see a tool or a, a productive tool based on those because they are typically under NDA, so they are for customers. And we also build tools based on this technology for our customers, but we are never allowed to show them. Now, this is an exception, so this work was done as part of a research project, so it's actually fully open source, and that's why I can show it. So rather than showing um, a lot of technical details, I actually want to do a tour through the features of that tool um, and show you how it looks in the IDE and roughly explain you how we did it. Um, the goal of the talk from my side would be to give you an overview of what's possible in theory, how it looks like, how we build it, if you're interested in any details, just talk to us after the talk. We are happy to provide more insight and the code is also available. Now, um, while this talk is not focused on smart home, just one slide of introduction to tell you what we actually do, because that's important to understand the whole demonstration. Now, um, independently of this Thea work, uh, we develop as part of a research project um, a smart home system. It's based on Eclipse Smart Home. Um, and the major idea of that system is to make it easier for end users to get new features on their system. Um, and the prototype that we actually follow is the idea of an app store. So rather than uh, coding something in JavaScript in a web IDE for the end user, we want to separate the developer who actually provides some features and the end user who can just install the features. So the idea is we have an app store. You can publish apps there. Apps are basically small pieces of code implementing a certain feature, as for example, turning a light on and off. Um, what those, but those apps are not already deployed. They just define devices or states that they require during runtime. For example, the light switch app requires a remote control and a light. And now the end user does not have to care about how it's implemented. Um, he or she can just go to the app store and say, oh, cool, a light switch. I want that installed on my system. And then you can click the app and install it on your system. And you just have to tell the system, OK, this is my remote, and this is my light, and then the feature is ready to go. So that's the background. Um, now what's missing, or what was missing so far, is actually a tool um, which supports the developer um, in creating the app. So we need a tool which enables developers to write apps and publish them to the App Store. And we have such a tool based on Eclipse as a plugin for Eclipse. And we basically re-implemented that based on Theor. So why did we do that? So why did we replace the existing de desktop solution with a web base? Because that's an important question. We do not just do it for fun. Now the use case that we solve here um, is actually, I would consider, a perfect use case for web-based tooling because, first of all, those apps are pretty small. 
they're not very complex. They implement one specific features. Um, and because of that, the expected usage time that a developer spends on this tool is very short. Now, if you just develop an app, let's say, for two hours, uh, if you before that have to install a tool for half an hour, that actually distracts people. So we want to support getting on board very quickly, just writing one or two apps, a few hours, and then you're probably done with your work because there are other apps too. So very small period of usage, thereby the installation time matters a lot. Second is we target a little bit at hobby developers. Um, so we don't expect that there will be full-time app developers writing hundreds and hundreds of apps, but rather you have an idea, you want to realize that quickly, um, and then you publish it to the App Store. That's again why a simple tool is, is more important. Um, so we want a slim standalone tool, not a plugin to an existing IDE. So we don't want people to learn IntelliJ or Eclipse or whatever. It just, just, the tool should be simple and slim. And finally, and that's a very special thing about this use case, um, to use the system, you actually need a gateway. That's typically a Raspberry Pi. I have one over here. Um, so that's uh, uh, the, the app uh, uh, runtime is actually running on this. And now we already have a device in your network. Um, so we can actually, if we have a web-based solution, also deploy the tool on here. So you can just deliver the tool with the with the system, and if that's connected to your local network, you literally just have to access a URL in the browser, and you can also code for that system. So deployment is very simple. Okay, um, so why did we use Thea? Um, in a nutshell, it's cool, it's great, we really like it. Um, but more, more in detail, it's very extensible um, compared to other solutions. You can uh, extend everything, you can add everything, but you can also uh, remove stuff so that it's really a very slim tool at the end and you can really customize to uh, um, the UI or the tool to exactly what you want. It's well architectured, um, extensible via dependency injection. Uh, one thing that I personally find very important and a very good idea, it extensively reuses existing components. So it doesn't reinvent the wheel. So for example, the code editor is the Monaco code editor that's reused from VS Code. And at many other places, you see this fundamental pr principle in Thea, um, that Thea always tries to reuse uh, good solutions which are there rather than re-implementing everything from scratch. Uh, it already comes with a lot of core features like code editing, console, workspace, windowing, so on. So for our use case, this was pretty much everything we need. Um, you can deploy it in two versions, either browser-based or via Electron on the desktop. In our case, we have chosen the browser-based. And it has it, it's truly open source and has a great community. So it was initiated um, over like one and a half years ago by Typefox and Ericsson, but in our days there are many contributors from different companies. So it really has speed and a great community. So that's why we have actually chosen that. Um, quick overview of the architecture. I do not want to go too much in details because there are other technical talks about Thea, but in a nutshell, um, Thea consists of a front-end part and a back-end part. Um, and you can extend the front-end or the back-end, front-end with UI components, back-end with services. And now you can either deploy both together uh, locally, um, that would be the desktop use case, so that's Electron in a node server, or you can deploy those two parts independently. That's what we have here. So the server part is running uh, on the Raspberry Pi. So it's demo time. Um, for the remaining uh, time of my talk, I will demonstrate the different feature, or I will quickly explain the features that we implemented on the slide, and then I will directly demo that. Um, as mentioned, rather than going into technical detail too much, I rather want to present the whole life cycle. So it should just show you, okay, that's possible. If you want to learn more, talk to us. Um, I will not present all the use cases on one slide beforehand. That would be pretty boring. I'll explain them just in the, uh, in the order that a user of our system would actually execute them. Okay. So first thing that we wanted to do is adding a custom menu. That's the simplest case um, because we wanted to play some, some actions in Thea. Um, this is no rocket science, that's very simple. The major reason I wanted to show you um, this too is that you get a very um, brief idea on how coding or extensions work in Thea. So um, this would be the code in Thea to register a new command. 
um, which is pretty much the same as you know from the Eclipse IDE. So it's a definition of something that you can trigger. And as you can see, so first of all, it works with dependency injection. And then you get a command registry in. And there you can register your new command with an ID and a handler. And the handler, that's the code below, actually then uh, implements the behavior you want to execute. Now, if you look at that code, if you're familiar with um, the desktop version of Eclipse, that's from, from a conceptual point of view, that's pretty much the same. Although you don't deal with extension points, but you directly write code and register uh, this code wire dependency injection. But it's uh, very easy to get started with this. And al also those cases are well documented. Now, um, additional step is then to register a menu that works pretty much the same. Again, I have a contribution registered via dependency injection. I get a menu model registry, and in that I can register my action, which points to, to, to the command. And if, if I do that, I, uh, and then I click the menu, then I trigger the handler that I registered before. So nothing complicated, um, and just for completion, so that's the that's our ID, basic styling, and what we actually added with this code is this smart home menu here with a couple of actions, which I will go into detail in a second. Now, currently my workspace is empty. By the way, this is running in the browser. Um, so maybe I make this a little bit bigger. Um, so currently my workspace is empty and the first thing that we want support to support with our tool is scaffolding. Um, as we want to make it simple for users to get started, we want to uh, enable them to create a template where they can just start to code. Because as mentioned, we target at hobby developers, so they should not, uh, yeah, it should be simple for them to get started. So what we actually did is uh, we added a um, option here to create a new project. Um, However, um, for, for creating a project, we have to create quite some files. Um, some of them are parameterized by, for example, the name of the app and some, some other parameters. Um, so uh, we thought about how do we do that in here. In Eclipse, you would have the new project wizard and framework. Um, there is currently nothing there in here supporting that. However, um, if we remember this uh, don't reinvent the wheel principle, um, there is, of course, uh, a great scaffolding support already um, uh, ba uh, available uh, on a node server uh, implemented by Yeoman. So almost every project uses Yeoman in our days to, to uh, create template and scaffolding projects. And for that reason, we it's completely fine that Thea doesn't offer something. We just used Yeoman. So what we actually did to implement this feature is we added a handler to the menu. We implemented a very simple custom dialog that's easy to do with HTML and TypeScript. Um, this dialog um, allows the user to enter the parameters we need for the project. And then uh, from this dialog, we pass the parameters to a very s slim component uh, running in the backend, uh, a Yo server. And this one, this component just retrieves the parameters and then calls Yeoman and we created our template in, in Yeoman, and um, this will then create all the files we need for the project. Very, very pragmatic solution, but works very nicely in practice. So we don't need to reinvent some, some framework uh, to create projects. We can just use what's there. Other advantage of that solution is now, if somebody doesn't want to use our tool, but I don't know, code on the command line, you can also use the same template because it's available in the standard like Yeoman in this case. Okay, so let's do that. So I click on create new project. I can assign a name. I can assign a description. Uh, we try to turn it on. And my name. Like this. And then I just hit enter. And then now you see, um, because Yeoman creates those files on the back end, and the front end automatically refreshes and shows me all those files. What would be ideal, and we probably will do that in the future if we don't show all the files to the user, but just filter to the ones that are really relevant for him. So at the moment, it's a lot of stuff and the user needs to know where to click. Okay, um, so next feature um, is uh, very special to our use case. Um, 
as I mentioned before, um, apps are small code pieces, but they access some devices during runtime. So during development time, um, you need to define the dependencies on devices that you have. Like for example, you need to define that you need a remote control or a light. Um, so the, and you code against those dependencies, which are later on bound um, against real devices. So to support the user to define those dependencies, we need some editor. Um, we could have done a textual editor, but we wanted to make it a little bit more um, user-friendly. Um, so what we actually wanted to support is a tree-based editor, or where you can click and add your dependencies, pretty much like the manifest editor in Eclipse. So that was our vision. Um, now, how did we implement that? Um, the dependency file is already there in our template, and Thea allows to register custom editors for any file type, pretty much like Eclipse again. Um, and for the implementation of the editor, um, we can actually, we could have used any HTML framework we want. So that's a, a important point because the whole thing is based on HTML. You can actually use HTML frameworks for your custom views. And in our case, or for this tool, we have used a framework called JSON Forms. Um, which makes it pretty simple to um, create form-based UIs and, and trees. Um, so I will not go into detail about the implementation, but what the important key uh, takeaway is for the implementation of views, just look at the available frameworks for your for this particular use case. You're not bound to SWT anymore. You have the full space of web solutions um, available. If you're interested in JSON forms, there will be a talk tomorrow uh, morning uh, called JSON forms 2. So how does that look like? Um, I open my so-called AD file, that stands for App Dependencies. And now um, there's a handler registered and now I see a form-based UI here, which as a root node shows me the light switch. And now as children nodes of this light switch, I can actually uh, create dependencies. So there's a plus symbol here. And those are all the possible dependencies. For my app, I will need a remote control and I will need a power supply. Um, I don't have a light switch. The reason is that this is a traditional light and it's plugged into a power supply. So I'm actually targeting a power supply at the end. And that's basically it. Um, on the right side, you could have now added uh, properties. Um, I will not go into detail about that. Again, um, Good thing was that we could just reuse a framework which, make the, which made the implementation of this editor very, very efficient. Now, the next feature uh, that we wanted to implement is once you have defined your dependencies, you actually switch to code. Um, it's typically one class that you implement, and this class gets um, some parameters in. Those parameters are actually the devices, or more precisely, the state of the devices that you depend on and then you can implement your logic. Now, as we want to su support the user as good as possible, we actually want to generate um, this class for you so that you already have all the parameters in place and can directly start coding. Now, um, that uh, requires some code generation. So actually, uh, the code generator looks at the dependency file and from this dependency file generates the stub of the app. Um, and we already had implemented that in the Eclipse version. Now, as we didn't want to just re-implement it because that was quite some work, um, what, we actually, what we actually did is uh, we refactored the existing code generator a bit so that it stays less and um, we added a, a small REST service which makes the code generator available as a service. And with this refactoring, we can actually deploy our existing code generator in the backend. It's actually really an Eclipse instance. So there is, on the backend, there is a uh, custom Eclipse instance running, offering this code generator as a REST service. And in the front end, we added a on save handler. That's an action that can be triggered on save of a certain editor. And this on save handler calls the REST service and tells it, okay, please generate with the following dependencies. And then um, the existing code generator, which was not changed at all, so that's just Java code, creates the app step. Stop, sorry. 
So let's demo that. So currently this is dirty. That's as, um, shown by this circle. And now if I save this, um, the code generator run, runs in the background. And if we look here, um, that's the generated code. Um, now the app step contains exactly the two states that I just defined. So it gives me in a Boolean, which is the state of the remote and the power supply, which is of type on off actor. Now, if I would change the dependency, this would generate again and add the parameters that I need. So I can directly start code. Okay, um, next thing, code editing. Um, that was really literally no, no work at all. Um, reason for that is that the Monaco code editor is already integrated in Thea. Um, plus there is a language server available based on um, JDT. Um, so the code editor connects to that server and enables all the features that you would expect from a code editor like autocomplete syntax highlighting and so on. And that's like in, in, in here, that's literally one line that you add in the dependency file and then you're ready to go. So, oh my God, <laughs> hopefully <laughs> it will last until the end of the demo. Um, so let's demo that. Um, you might be interested in how this code editing in, in Thea looks like. Now let's just code this app. Um, so what do we need to do? Um, we get in a Boolean, that's the remote. So I can use autocomplete. Um, or actually I want to check if remote, that means if the state of the remote is true, that means the user has pressed the button. And then I need to check if power supply is on, then I call power supply. Uh, no, sorry, if, if it's off. <laughs> Thanks for not helping me. If it's true, if it's not on, like this. Um, then we turn it on like this and in the else case we turn it off. Is it correct now? Somebody sees a mistake? No, should be fine. Um, reason I did this, I just wanted to show you if you um, with this language server and this code editor, coding in, in Thea really feels like on the desktop version. There are some exceptions, of course, like um, some actions that you're used to, maybe control one or something. Um, but for regular users or for if you don't write tons of code, it's really, really, really usable. And it, it's a lot of fun. So um, uh, this is, and then this was actually the cheapest feature because we didn't have to do anything basically here. Okay, um, now let's switch over to the next feature. Uh, what we want to enable for our uh, tool users is writing and running tests. Um, reason for that is um, if you write an app against abstract um, dependencies, you actually need to test it before you push it to the app store because you don't know that it actually works. And that's one of the core ideas behind the whole thing that you can uh, write an app once really properly tested and then it should be reusable for multiple users. Uh, the traditional way of trying those things out is to publish them on the system and then just walk around with remotes and so on and trying it out as um, until it works. And um, we found that to be very inefficient. So that's why we want enable testing. Um, now, writing the JUnit test is actually already supported by the same code editor. So that's already done. Um, now, one thing that we found missing is a, a capability to run JUnit tests. Um, so what we did for that is we went for a very pragmatic solution, um, which is a, but which is also a good template in case you're missing a certain feature. And the nice thing is that you can actually access the console, meaning the underlying operating system from within Thea on the server. And using the console, you can actually trigger any tool which has a command line interface. And you can trigger JUnit on the command line too. So the very simple solution we went with is um, we added a menu item um, which is shown on test cases and this menu item triggers a command on the uh, console 
which basically runs the JUnit test case uh, with a command line parameter and it shows the result. Um, very nice extension for that would be to show the results again in the UI so you could actually retrieve the results and then visualize them with some HTML um, there, and there are already frameworks which actually do that so for example if you run a full Maven build there are, there are some frameworks which um, con convert the results of the Maven test into an HTML and again as we're running in the browser we could just show that so uh, probably with very little effort we could even make this nicer so let's demo that. Um, so here we have the test. So let's do a test. Um, actually, I will not really write a test. Um, so currently it fails. Um, so let's just run it. So here, this is the menu item we added. And now we see down here, OK, there is a failure. And now uh, let's fix this. Assert. I don't know, something like this. Okay, everything runs great. And then it looks like that. Um, very simple solution, but almost no effort to implement. And again, what would be great, some additional UI, which shows that more prominent and more detailed to the user. Okay, um, final use case uh, for today um, is to actually deploy the app. Um, for that, the app must be copied to a app server. Um, so that's basically providing a REST um, service where you can actually push apps. Um, this use, implementing this use case was very, very trivial because we are already on the same system. Um, so the apps, in, in our scenario, the app, uh, the app store also runs on the same system. So we can just basically copy it over. So what we did is writing a very sm uh, small deploy service, which we call from a handler. Um, and then we push it to the app store. Uh, if the app store is running somewhere in the internet, of course, we have to change the target address for that. But not much to implement there. Um, other part of this use case would be the build. So we need to convert our code into a deployable artifact. Um, in our case, a bundle, um, bundled as a jar file. Um, and for that, we again took the same solution as for the JUnit test case. We basically added an action, which then triggers the build command on the command line. So you can actually watch it in the console. Again, probably to make it a little bit nicer, you could add some UI showing the results in a more user-friendly way. But um, nice thing about this solution is that it's almost no effort to do. So let's trigger the build. Um, so here we have run build. And we can offer this in the, in the menu because we created the template um, from scratch and we actually know where artifacts are located because we are in this closed scenario. So that's why it's so simple. So we run the build on here you can watch the results. Um, you can actually see that target folder is there and this is now finally the um, this would be the artifact to deploy and now here we have an action deploy app and this actually copies it over to the app store okay talking about the app store now finally um, after almost half an hour of talk I've created an app uh, which can switch a light on and off hopefully hopefully it works um, compared to this Thea thing, smart home demonstrations tend to be very unstable. So be friendly if it doesn't work. So let's see. So I switch over to my smart home system. So now this has nothing to do with Thea. That's actually the web UI of the smart home system running on this Raspberry Pi. And this Raspberry Pi is connected to a power supply here and to this remote control. So that's set up, but there's currently no behavior deployed on the um, on the Raspberry. So that's exactly what I just developed and what I want to push now on this device. So I click on apps. That's now accessing the app store and shows the list, uh, um, the user with a list of available apps that he or she can install. Now here I see my light switch app that I just deployed. So let's take this. 
And now during the installation process, um, the app asks me to bind the dependencies. And those are the dependencies that I defined in my tool, um, which my app needs to run. So remote control, I have only one remote control on my system. So that's a simple choice. I take this one and power supply. Again, I have only one power supply, so it's a simple choice. And now I can click install and now I've installed the behavior that I just implemented on my Raspberry Pi. And once this is done, um, hopefully, if I click here, yeah, it works. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Well, I want another applause if it does. <laughs> Let's see. Yay. <laughs> okay, so coming to a conclusion. Um, so uh, the, the key takeaways um, that we had from this project, by the way, I should mention, um, so if you're interested in the effort that we have spent of on, on developing all of this, this was actually a small team which, which worked on this for one week. So it, it was really low effort. I mean, you can obviously see that there is huge potential to make it even nicer, like filtering things out, maybe some wizards. But what we wanted to focus on is basically bringing the complex fun functionality for our use case um, in the tool, which is, for example, the code generation, the build, um, this dependency editor, encoding, and so on. And that was really, really fast to implement and really well supported. So the first takeaway is if you have a use case which is already well supported by the existing framework and tools, and this was kind of the, the perfect use case for that, um, it is really low effort. Um, if you have a very complex use case, that might not be true for your project. Um, and second key takeaway uh, would be um, follow the principle that Tier established for all for itself. Um, before you reinvent the wheel and before you create now new frameworks that you are used to from from the Eclipse world in the web area, um, just look out what's there. Switching to this new technology stack opens up um, ac the access to a lot of technologies which kind of became standard outside of the Eclipse world, like Yeoman, for example. Um, or Maven, or I don't know. Um, and it's typically a better idea to reuse those technologies if possible uh, and just benefit from them. And this doesn't only lower the effort of your implementation, it also keeps your implementation more flexible. So as for example, for what if for whatever reason you don't want to use Thier in two years from now, um, you can still reuse the Yeoman, Yeoman template. Typical use case could be you want to go for a standalone solution and not embed any here things because you want to make the UI even more simple, but still you can reuse the stuff which you implemented based on some standard technology. And um, yeah, and I mean, in general, web technologies are more volatile, so they come and go more frequently. So that's why I think you should spend some thoughts on selecting the technologies which really have proven to, to remain for some time and to be stable standards. Yeah, that's basically it. I hope you enjoyed the demonstration. As mentioned, not too much technical details. I don't have a slide, but um, if you're interested in, the, in these technologies, you can easily find a lot of Thea talks um, through the remaining program of the conference. Um, if you're interested in a specific part that I've shown you, um, just join us at our booth anytime. I can show you the code. I can show you more details on, on what we've done. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. And I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, w was the question that we that if we had problems or whether it's so slim? Yeah, 
so the yeah so experience is um when we when we got started with we we had problems because of this um multiple threads i think we were in contact with you anyway about this bug report after that was resolved it runs fine um so message is it is very slim problem is the eclipse instance <laughs> Yeah, so we had um, we had to cut that down, and actually we are at the border. Uh, what's possible on the Raspberry Pi because we run uh, Thier, this Eclipse instance plus the app system, and that's why actually the app system is pretty slow then at the end. So, but conclusion is Thier is not the problem. Um, although for the Eclipse instance, if we would spend more effort in stripping that down um, to a very so at the moment we we didn't remove all the bundles we could remove yeah. so i think it's possible to have a productive solution at the end if you spend some more effort on that any other questions stop <laughs> okay and thanks for attending this kindly consider to evaluate this session if you liked it if you don't like it just forget about it 